Welcome and thank you for joining us this morning for Issues and Views, Buffalo, New York's weekly public affairs program focusing on topics and concerns that affect you and your community. We hope the information you hear today is beneficial to you. Now here's your Issues and Views host, Todd Anderson. Good morning and welcome to Issues and Views. I'm your host, Todd Anderson, and I have with me an honor to have uh, Dr. Igor Puzinov, he is the director of the Early Phase Clinical Trials Program at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. And the implication within uh, his title is that there is a clinical trial for um, the a, a drug to combat uh, COVID-19 and the coronavirus. And we're pretty excited about that. Dr. Puzinov, thanks for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And um and uh, good day to all the listeners. Now, uh, we were talking uh, prior to us being on the radio about this, uh, this, this drug trial. And I just want people to understand before we begin that this is a drug to help people who are already positive. This isn't necessarily any type of preventative uh, um, vaccine type drug. This is a drug to help people who already are positive, which is very, very exciting. Is that correct? That is correct. Actually, we we are excited about this uh, this trial, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have about you know who is it for, what is the mechanism, you know how this is going to help, you know where is it available, all of it. Right. Well, tell us tell us that. Well, first of all, tell us how Roswell Park um, got involved in this drug trial because this I, so, I understand you know, I, I understand this is also uh, in partnership with the University of Buffalo with UB, right? Yes, that's correct. You know, so, you know, this is really, you know, like drug development is a small world. And, uh, you know, when you think about how you develop drugs for people with cancer, you know, a lot of the drugs, you know, can be used for other diseases as well. And there is a big overlap now, you know, using immune system harnessing to fight cancer. And, of course, we use the immune system to fight infection. So ever since I got in Buffalo, you know, became the director of the early phase clinical trials. Um, uh, we work with uh, Dr. Gene Morse, who is the world-known uh, virus researcher, HIV researcher at University at Buffalo, involved with a global virus network, you know, which is a, a global network to study viruses. And uh, we actually try to put together a system where researchers can uh, call us and uh, we help them develop their ideas you know, for useful drugs, both at UB and at Roswell. So when COVID hit, uh, I will became more involved with the network, which is mostly researchers, basic researchers who study viruses. Uh, I am uh, someone who is uh, involved in my whole career in developing drugs for people, the clinical trials. Mm. And of course, you know, uh, this is a worldwide problem. So my collaborators in Italy, uh, Dr. Ascerto in Naples, are fighting, you know, longer than we are. And they found out, uh, you know, together with uh, the Chinese scientists, you know, who are the first, that uh, the patients who get in real trouble with COVID, the ones who have the storm of their immune system, the cytokine storm and need ventilators, that uh, there could be help by getting a uh, immune suppression because, you know, too much of a good thing is a bad thing for them. And uh, they used a specific drug called tocilizumab. You know, it's FDA approved. We use it. And believe it or not, we use that drug for patients with cancer. You know, that's the one uh, patients who get the cell therapies, you know, we are known for in the area that we give cell therapies to fight cancer. Right. And one of the side effects of getting a cell therapy can be a cytokine storm. And tocilizumab is used. So this is basically... Uh, come in full circle, you know, and uh, sarilumab is uh, kind of like a sister drug to tocilizumab, you know, it blocks the inflammation and, you know, we we brought it in very quickly. Well, that's very good news. And uh, Dr. P, you mind if I call you Dr. P? Oh, it's perfectly fine. A lot of people do. It's, <laughs> okay. it's much simpler. All right. All right. Well, Dr. P, um, very good information. And, you know, you mentioned that um, you've been doing research for a while. I know that you're from the Czech Republic. And uh, then you um, were in Nashville for a while to uh, lead the drug development program there. And now you're at Roswell and we're very pleased and honored and lucky to have you here. Blessed as well. Where, how do you possibly begin to know what, what to do to develop a drug for that? It's, it's pretty amazing. 
Well, you know, you have to think about the, the, the virus infection, you know, from the get go, you know, to the end. And, uh, you know, remember most of the people who get infected, you know, get infected through the, the air. And uh, a lot of them will not even know. But some of them will, you know, and the virus kind of comes to the nose and uh, then lives there and then goes down to the lung. And you may get cough and fever and now everybody knows, you know, you may you may have a COVID so uh, there is a group, you know, which is looking into that. And uh, the first drug in that area, the early infection, is the uh, hydroxychloroquine with antibiotic, you know, azithromycin, you know, uh, hopefully clearing the virus quicker. Because obviously, if you clear the virus at that stage, you know, right. it's closed, you don't need anything. And uh, for that, you need testing. And uh, so people are working on tests and uh, getting them available, and a lot of them. And uh, and then, of course, other antiviral drugs you can use early, kind of like we treat flu with Tamiflu. You know, you just uh, get a flu, I give you Tamiflu, you know, you clear the, the virus quicker. Right. And uh, some of the drugs already kind of uh, far away are the drugs which uh, already been tested, for, like, say, for flu or Ebola, like uh, Topiravir or uh, the Remes Desivir. And uh, and that's uh, actually ongoing, and we should have the data, you know, coming out in the next couple of weeks. If that works, that would be wonderful. But, of course, what about the patients who uh, get uh, actually sicker, uh, who go through that first phase, and instead of getting better, they are getting worse. They need to be admitted to the hospital. They barely can breathe and need oxygen. They may need to be intubated. Well, there is not enough ventilators, you know, that's... Uh, the story and uh, you know being on a ventilator is not uh, is not nice by itself. So uh, you know people very quickly realize that those patients actually don't suffer from uh, you know just the virus, but the virus is revving up their you know immune system beyond you know kind of uh, usefulness you know beyond belief. Right. And uh, they said let's put a break on it and uh, started using the tocilizumab you know the drug. We actually, you know, uh, use even in oncology for patients with overactive immune system after cell therapies. And, uh, you know, and of course, you know, there is more than one drug for every uh, possibility. So sarilumab, you know, also blocks that uh, inflammation. You know, we call it interleukin-6 receptor, you know, pathway. And, uh, you know, the early data, again, you know, we are very, very quick and very, very early suggest that this may work. and. Uh, Fingers crossed, you know, that we may avoid uh, the uh, putting patients on a ventilator. So if they get to the point where they are uh, breathing heavily and need oxygen, if uh, that drug actually is used and uh, is causing them to become better quicker, we may not need uh, the, uh, the ventilators. That would be actually a wonderful outcome. And this is uh, the aim of the study uh, I am leading uh, here in Buffalo, oh, uh, which is now open. You mentioned within what you just said that uh, you can contract this virus through the air. So I know that we have this six foot rule. Um, and I've asked this question time and time again, and, and it sounds like you might be able to answer it. Um, so you don't have to touch the person. You don't have to touch something. You can actually get this virus from the air. It's airborne. Correct. That is correct. And, uh, you know, the, you know, believe it or not, you know, three weeks ago, uh, my wife was actually at the Buffalo News and uh, on different TVs because uh, as soon as we uh, realized, you know, that this is, uh, you know, transferred through the air, um, you know, she started actually suing the uh, homemade uh, cotton mask, uh, which I believe everybody should be wearing. Uh, because, you know, when you go shopping and, uh, and you speak to the cashier, and a lot of people do, uh, I, I'm really afraid that, you know, you may actually infect that cashier, you know, if you carry the virus, because you may be asymptomatic. You may be fine. You don't even know you have a virus. You may right. no harm, but you still may actually spit the virus out. And, uh, you know, remember, these cotton masks are not going to protect you from uh, getting the virus into you. But it, uh, they do protect actually good 70 percent, you know, uh, to actually spin the virus at other people. And if everybody has masks, you know, when we get closer to each other, like in a shopping center or, you know, when, when you kind of uh, go and there is more people around, uh, there is no actually there is no downside. You know, people should have them. 
uh, as you know, there is discussion now finally, you know, in the U.S. to actually have that rule. I think they are worried about uh, people buying the professional grade, uh, you know, respirators, which we need for the desperately need for the frontline responders. Uh, to which I would point actually to the Czech Republic. You know, we are originally from. Uh, they have a homemade mask, you know, movement. And it started here, you know, in Buffalo, there is a Facebook page, you know, my wife is on it, you know, it's called uh, Rescue Buffalo. Uh, the guys are doing a great job making masks, making respirators, you know, uh-huh. making shields, you know. Right. Uh, there is a whole sway of people actually engaged and uh, and you and other outlets were doing a great job to, you know, to kind of bring that to attention to people. It's just uh, much slower than I would have liked. Yeah, this is this is very, very, very extremely important because, you know, people go on social media, <clears throat> excuse me, they watch television. There was one emergency room doctor who was urging people that, that they didn't have to wear a mask if they're not sick. I wear a mask anyway because I, I can't imagine how it can't help you. And just based on what you're saying, uh, such that this uh, virus is, is airborne, you can even be speaking with someone. Uh, when, you, when you speak to someone, you can't really see the different um, particles that are coming out of your mouth into the air. They're invisible. Um, so the mask has definitely got to be uh, something that, that can help in that respect. Yeah. So I would, I would stress, again, cover your face, you know, when out, you know, especially when people are around. And do it not with a professional grade mask. Please leave those for people in the emergency rooms and in ICUs. They really, really need them. There is a shortage of N95 respirators, surgical masks. But everybody can go online and everybody can actually make themselves, you know, a cotton based mask. You know, it's like seven by seven piece of cotton, you wrinkle it, you know, if you have a sewing machine, you kind of sew it on the sides, and then you have a little, you know, piece of rubber or, you know, whatever you want to affix it to your head. You can even use bandana, you can use other things, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. And again, it doesn't protect you from acquiring the virus, you know, this is not that professional grade, but actually it protects others if you, you know, from you, if you were infected and you didn't even know, because unfortunately this virus is sneaky, it may infect you and you don't know right. and uh, and so you never experience and or you may eventually know but you believe it or not you may give it to somebody two days before you even knew right. and i know most of the people are considerate and they want to do the best thing and uh you know there is a plenty of information out there and uh and please, you know, do that, you know, we want to protect each other. And if I'm protecting you from myself and you protect uh, you from, you know, like me from yourself, then we are protecting each other. And uh, it's a, I think it's a neighborly thing to do. Right, right. There's a, I, I, there's a uh, saying, um, if I can remember it, um, how does it go? Uh, um, it, it, something about it's, it's okay to be apart now so we can embrace later. Something like something to that effect. Um, but I, I want to ask you just one more question about this masking. Um, so you put a mask on, you go to the store, you do whatever you got to do. You come home. Do you do you throw the mask away? Do you use it again? Wash it? Well, how do you, how does that work? So you know, I told you, you know, my wife is uh, is uh, is a craft uh, you know person, and uh, she's making them for like everybody. You know, she, you know, every day she makes like ten, twenty for neighbors and people, and and such. And uh, so I actually bring the mask home, and if I only had one, I would just dump it in a in a bucket full of uh, hot water. You know, just boil it. You know, because it's too small to put in a washing machine. You know, if I have more than one, which I do, I just uh, put it in a garage, you know, in a kind of a separate bin, you know, together with my scraps and, you know, clothes from work because I don't, I try not to bring them, you know, to home. Uh And then I just put everything in a washing machine. But, you know, for the regular person, you know, who just came from Wegmans, you can take that mask and, uh, you know, if you have a pot of water, just have it boiling and uh, just dump it there for a couple of minutes, you know. And uh, boiling water kills the virus, you know, under five minutes. And uh, then you just let it dry and you can iron it and you are done. That virus actually dies at about uh, 70 degrees Celsius, which I believe is like 160, 170 Fahrenheit. Oh, okay. All right. That's good to know. Um, one more thing before we get back into talking about the, the drug um, trial. Um, kids, you see kids outside playing 
um, you know, uh, parents are letting kids uh, go outside and play basketball. I, I see some kids uh, back here right now as I'm speaking to you. I'm, I'm working from home, but I see some kids outside playing basketball. These are young kids. I'd say 10, 11, 12, 8, 9 years old. And there are a number of kids playing with this basketball. Is that something that you would recommend? You know, <laughs> a tough question there. Um, you know, uh, even kids should be kind of separate. You know, the six feet rule, you know, is better than nothing. Um, you know, and, uh, and, you know, I would say if, as long as they are, you know, like maybe shooting a hoop, you know, you still can, you know, you still can actually leave the virus on the ball. You right. know, that's, uh, that's true, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get around, you know, I, you know, my kids kind of, you know, kind of socialize, they go on a bike ride together, you know, there's one on a the bike, then six right. feet, there's another one on a bike. You know, we do that. You know, we don't do the the the, the pick up basketball games. You know, right. I, I I probably would stay away from that. You know, the you know whether you can have a friend over and uh, shoot the you know hoops kind of like one at a time. Right. You know, that's a, that's a different story. Probably should be limited to just couple of kids and uh, you know try to try to you know not uh, not have the transmission because the kids don't get as uh, as, as much of a sickness. You know, but uh. They can be, uh, they can be the the conduit, you know. They can be the transmitter, right? And right. Uh, and of course, then they come home, and uh, and and again, you know, they don't know. And uh, if we had a test for everybody and could just swab them, you know, that would be easy. You know, just do a little swab and say, yeah, you're fine. You know, you can do whatever you want. Right, absolutely. But uh, unfortunately, we are not there yet. You know, like I wish we were, but we are not there yet. So I think playing it safe or safer, you know, is probably preferred. But yeah, it's, uh, kind of, it's hard on everybody. It is hard. Yeah, it's kind of unfortunate too because kids don't go out and play anymore. <laughs> but uh, but now they're so, outside playing, and it's uh, kind of bad timing. Uh, so yeah, let's let's get back into uh, uh, speaking about the uh, the drug. What is the drug called? Is there a name for, for this drug? Yeah, you know, it's called uh, Sarilumab. You know, uh, I I'm blanking on the. Uh, on the actual, you know, trade name, uh, but a sarilumab, you know, is an antimony, you know, meaning that it's a, you know, like a piece of a, of a protein, you know, which, uh, you know, uh, is uh, homing on something called the uh, interleukin-6 receptor. So remember, the cells have little hooks on their surface, and uh, we call them receptors, mm. and uh, they have different functions. And this one particular is on the cells which carry the uh, which actually carry the uh, uh, immune cells, you know, on its surface. So, you know, you do that and you prevent these immune cells from getting activated, you know, excited and uh, and protect people. Uh, so you currently have some individuals enrolled in the trial, right? We do. We actually do. And, uh, and we enroll first patient within, literally, we got the, uh, the discussion going with, uh, uh, the Regeneron, you know, the maker of the drug on uh, uh, on Saturday night, you know, it's mm. called, actually the drug is called Kevzara, K-E-V-Z-A-R-A, Sarilumab Kevzara. Mm. And, uh, and we had a bigger discussion, you know, later that Saturday on uh, Sunday, about 10.30 in the morning, we got a protocol. And uh, and our team at Razo was able to just open it by Tuesday. And we enrolled first patient yesterday, which wow. is uh, Thursday. And so, uh, you know, you know, remind your listeners that normally such a such a you know process takes three to six months, right, you know, right. more like six than three. And uh, this is amazing. And uh, I'm just getting like real life, you know, feedback from my collaborators at uh, UB and uh, and Kaleida. And it uh, looks like, you know, we will be able to open those centers today wow. or tomorrow. So this is amazing because remember, you know, it's not just opening in one place. You know, that's uh, difficult enough. But this is a collaboration and it's collaboration under gun, you know, at a time when everything is uh, uh, is more difficult, you know, it's constrained. And every, people are just working 24-7 on that, you know, starting with the with the with the with the with the scientists, you know, with the lawyers, with doctors, with the research coordinators, you know, uh, data managers, you know, all the people, pharmacists who have to make the drug, the the laboratory people who have to collect, you know, different samples. It's a clinical trial, 
you know, drivers who need to drive those samples. You know, there's a right. lot going on into that process, you know, a lot more than just simply giving the drug to the patient. Uh-huh. And um, uh, the way it is going, I will assure your listeners that uh, we will close this trial. You know, this is a nationwide trial with 400 patients. Mm. Uh, the way it's enrolling, it's going to, you know, finish the enrollment of all 400, you know, by early next week. Right. Uh, then we are looking for improvement, like you said, you know, in those patients. And uh, we should know in, you know, in a week, you know, whether you are better or not, you know, that's, uh, that's easy enough. Right. Once that is done... You know, we need to get the data together and uh, clean it and analyze it. You know, that's another way. And uh, there we go, you know, to FDA. And uh, uh, if, uh, you know, I'm no prophet, but I can imagine that this, if this is good, you know, as good as we hope it is, that we should get FDA approval within a single digit months, you know, not uh, five years or anything like that. You know, remember what happened with hydroxychloroquine, the first, you know, talk of January. And as you know, by the end of uh, March, it is FDA approved in the United States. So this right. is a uh, extra time, you know, uh, calling for, uh, you know, extra speedy action. It's been tested in Italy, correct? So, uh, th- you know, not this drug, you know, it's a different drug called okay. Tocilizumab, you know, it's a, but it's, it's a similar type of mechanism of action. You okay. know, remember, you have your uh, Advil and you have your ibuprofen, you know, right. kind of a similar things. Uh, and uh, in Italy, they do not have, you know, yet, you know, official data, but uh, the 30 patients Dr. Ascierto, you know, treated in Naples, you know, and elsewhere, uh, most of them were getting better very quicker and uh, very quickly, and uh, 21 patients, you know, experienced in China suggested the same thing, and they did exactly the same, you know, uh, you know trial. They did like 330 patients in Italy, and enroll them within 24 hours and are awaiting the final data. And I'm actually, you know, uh, talking to Dr. Ascierto daily, and uh, and he gives me, you know, the feedback on their, you know, results, and it looks uh, looks positive. And, uh, you know, so again, you know, I cannot overpromise, you know, I cannot divulge, you know, anything which is covered by confidentiality, but uh, at the same time, you know, we wouldn't be doing the trial if we didn't have a... Uh, you know, like a, like a hint that this could be this could be positive. Uh, but of course, the data will win the day. You know, you need a data because FDA, you know, works with uh, evidence, and uh, we are right. giving them the evidence uh, as fast as we can. Um, who is the standard candidate for this trial? So the candidate is a patient who is proven to be infected with uh, the COVID virus. Uh, is the patient who is in a hospital requiring oxygen. And there are three categories of those patients. All of them are eligible, requiring some oxygen, uh, requiring a lot of oxygen, being on a ventilator, and uh, being on a ventilator and having end organ failure, meaning like not only you need a ventilator for breathing, but your kidney is failing, your liver is failing, other organs are failing. So we really take the patients who are in danger of losing their life and try to make them uh, better again, quicker. Okay, so this isn't necessarily available for someone who simply tests positive for um, COVID-19. Not at all. And uh, if you think about the mechanism of action, you know, decreasing, you know, the immune system overactivation, it may actually even be detrimental if you took it early. You know, if you simply were just COVID positive and took this drug, I would not recommend it. This is really when your immune system is somehow uh, not doing the job properly and instead of helping you, you know, to clear the virus is actually harming you because it's just getting into overdrive. Very similar to patients with lupus or with rheumatoid arthritis or Crohn's disease. We all know that those patients have immune system which is attacking their own body. And so do these uh, COVID patients when they get uh, these severe symptoms, you know, their mm-hmm. immune system is... Uh, attacking their own body if you're experiencing something that um is concerning to you personally such that you might have uh, or be developing coronavirus uh what would you recommend people do in that case 
So one, pick up the phone, don't go, but pick up the phone and call your doctor. Call your uh, regular doctor and say, look, you know, this is what I have, what should I do? And there are guidelines now issued by the New York State you know, and, uh, and, and CDC and, and uh, you know, the guidelines say, call your doctor, the doctor will listen to you and uh, they will tell you, go here or there, you know, get the test. Uh, usually these days we start with testing for other viruses, you know, meaning like a flu, Paraflu, you know, adenovirus, respiratory virus, I know like 20,000 viruses one can have. And uh, if all of that is negative, you know, then the question is, you know, how you feel. And uh, depends on the test availability. You know, if you start feeling worse, then the COVID test, you know, is important. So you know you have COVID and, uh, you know, what to do. If uh, you are not actually, you know, feeling worse, a lot of times, unfortunately, there are not enough tests and you will be told, well, you may have a COVID, but because you are not feeling, you know, bad, go home and quarantine for 14 days, meaning like really separate yourself from everybody. And uh, that is the state of the art right now. Uh, it's uh, going to change once we get more tests, because obviously you would want to know if you are COVID positive, because you would want to know that you really need to quarantine yourself right away from everybody. Right. But, uh, you know, the, we are getting there every day closer to that, you know, but uh, not there yet. So if you feel bad, if you have, uh, if you have um, shortness of breath, cough, chest pain, and fever, uh, you know, 100 or 99 more, uh, call your doctor. Since we know COVID is killed, actually, by, you know, being exposed to high levels of alcohol, you know, in, like, disinfectants. You know, uh -huh. that's why it's so important to wash your hands and wash the surfaces. Right, and you mentioned alcohol, so we don't want people thinking that I can just go buy some, you know, some 151 rum and drink it. <laughs> and you know, the, 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 believe it or not, you know, there were cases in Iran I read that actually they got uh, people poisoned with alcohol because they read exactly that and they did exactly that. And uh, no, you know, the alcohol I'm talking about is used outside of the body, you know, right, to clean right. your hands, to clean the surfaces, you know, that type of, you know, alcohol. Yeah, we yeah. just, just want to yeah, clarify, you know, I, just yeah. want to clarify that because people are, people will, uh, latch on to all kind of stuff that they hear so it's very 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 extremely important and we are so grateful and thankful um to have you uh on the on the radio here to explain to us that this is very very serious there, there there's no uh there's no home remedy that's gonna that's gonna solve this issue and we're very excited about this drug trial that you're doing at roswell park comprehensive cancer center so grateful for that and you're working along with UB and we're so grateful that you are here with us in Buffalo. Um, anything you want to add before we, before we close? I will just add that this is uh, this is such an unprecedented, uh, you know, speed, you know, on uh, collaboration, you know, between our institutions. And I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, fingers crossed that we are going to open this trial, you know, if not today, then tomorrow. Uh, uh, Buffalo General, uh, ECMC, and Miller Fillmore. Again, you know, for anyone uh, who knows anything about, you know, these collaborations, this is completely unprecedented. Right, exactly. In a good way. <laughs> we are trying to save lives. You know, it is really important. Everybody agrees that saving lives is good, so let's get going. Right. Now, is there, um, uh, if anyone has more questions about eligibility or, um, or anything related to the uh, the drug trial? Is there a phone number they can call? Is there a website they can go to? Absolutely. You know, they can call the, uh, um, you know, 1-800 number for Roswell. You know, we have, uh, we have that for our patients with cancer. Of course, during this time, we stay open for patients with cancer. We still open with, uh, you know, both standard treatments and clinical trials. They can call that uh, that uh, that uh, that line, and uh, or they can go online, you know, to the uh, RoswellPark.org uh, web page, and there is information. And uh, and uh, but again, you know, the trial really is for patients who are already in the hospital, you know. So that's uh, that's uh, that's really the condition. So if one is not in the hospital, one is not eligible for the trial. Right, and I looked up this. Uh uh, you mentioned an 800 number at Roswell, um, and I looked it up uh, as we're speaking, and it's 1-800-ROSWELL. 
So that's 1-800-767-9355. You can call that number to get more information uh, about this uh, this drug trial. Dr. Igor Puzinov is the director of the Early Phase Clinical Trials Program at Roswell Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Once again, sir, we just appreciate you so very much and thank you so much for this great information that you've passed along to us. Thank you very much. You have a great day and uh, all the best uh, to your listeners and to you and your family. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you very much. The views, opinions, and comments expressed on the program are those of the participants and not necessarily of this station.